Hello, everyone. Welcome to the session on taking serverless to the edge. Thank you all for uh, joining us today. I know a lot of you, or almost all of you, are away from work, away from home. So we really appreciate you being here at Reenwind and attending our session in particular. My name is George John. I'm a product manager in the Lambda at the Edge team. With me, uh, we have uh, Benjamin Fabra, who is the co-founder and CTO of DataDome and Will Sinclair, a senior solutions architect with AWS. So AWS Lambda, since its launch almost three years ago, has enabled serverless compute in ways that was never possible before. Now with Lambda at the edge, that went GA a few months ago, to be exact, July of 2017 this year, has made Lambda functions even more powerful over the next 60 minutes or so, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at why it makes sense or what is the benefit of running applications at the edge, whether, whether it's either extending your applications to the edge or running complete, truly serverless applications at the edge. We'll take a look at how Lambda at the edge can help you with that. So Will is going to walk you through several popular use cases. He's going to share some code samples and he's going to do a couple of demonstrations of how you can leverage Lambda at the edge for um, running an application at the edge. And then we're excited to have DataDome share their use case of how they have been helping their customers with real-time bot protection using uh, Lambda at the edge. So with that, uh, let's get started. So this is a 300 level talk. I'm assuming a lot of you know what serverless, serverless is, but let me just quickly go over it. Serverless really means that you can run your code without the need to set up servers, configure, provision, or manage servers. All that is done for you by Lambda. So you just provide a piece of code that you want to execute. It's an event-driven compute model, so you have to provide the code as well as the event or trigger for the function. Now, Lambda can scale automatically, so now you don't have to worry about or think about questions like, do I have enough capacity for the next six months? Do I need to set up more virtual machines or EC2 instances? Do I need to set up more containers? All that is abstracted away from you because Lambda, the Lambda can scale automatically in response to requests. You do not pay for cold or idle servers. You are only charged for the resources you consume. And finally, there it is. It has built-in availability and fault tolerance, meaning that you do not need to be distribution system experts to make sure your applications run in a highly fault tolerant manner. And Lambda today is available in all AWS regions. So as a customer of Lambda, you can select the region you want, and you can run your functions in the region you choose. And that works perfectly fine for many of the use cases. But imagine what if you could take that to the next step, right? What if you could run your Lambda functions at the edge? So the edge in this context refers to Cloudflare's global infrastructure. So Cloudflare is a CDN, a content distribution network offering from AWS. It was launched in uh, 2009, so it's been around for, or sorry, 2008, end of 2008. It's been around for close to nine years now. And over the years, we have been adding new capabilities and features and also expanding its infrastructure. So today we have 107 points of presence. So a point of presence can either be an edge location or a regional edge cache. An edge location is essentially a, a global network of data centers that CloudFront has and that uses to distribute to store and distribute your content. So if you're using CloudFront to, say, serve your website, for example, CloudFront will be leveraging its uh, global location to serve the content. And similarly, we have uh, regional edge caches. So regional edge caches are mid-tier caches that sits between an edge location and an origin. And these are available to you at no additional cost as a CloudFront customer. And uh, the key difference here is that regional edge caches, if you look at the uh, the map here are located in AWS regions, meaning that we have a lot more capacity, which translate to better cache width and cache hit ratio for you if you are a CloudFront customer. So Lambda at the Edge is really about running your Lambda functions at CloudFront locations. So now you're not in one region, but instead your functions are replicated across multiple AWS locations. And all the benefits of Lambda we talked about earlier are also available with Lambda at the Edge, because Lambda at the Edge is nothing but an extension of AWS Lambda. But a key benefit, a key additional benefit you get is the global distribution. So what do I mean by global distribution, right? 
Again, uh, the AWS locations I have here is not the full set. It's just a subset of the locations I have. Uh, but for simplicity, I just selected a few locations. So essentially, today, the functions you write as part of Lambda at the Edge need to be authored in North Virginia or US East 1 region. And so it's the same experience as any regular Lambda functions. You have the same capabilities. But once you publish the version, what happens is we automatically and transparently replicate the function to multiple locations worldwide. Right? So what is, it, what is the benefit to you? Now, okay, good. Your functions are now across the globe, but how does it really help? To answer that question, let's take a look at what a typical web application or website is made up of. Right? Typically, there is some sort of compute. It could be a virtual machine like an EC2 instance. It could be a container. It could be a function. There is some sort of storage. The storage, again, can be an S3 bucket. If you are a website, you would probably put all your static content like images, JavaScripts, HTML, CSS, all that in S3 bucket. It could be a file storage. And then you have some sort of database, whether it's relational or non-relational. So these are the three typical components that make up any application. Now, what CloudFront has enabled you to do is move the storage. So if you look at the, the uh, location there, you can see that storage icon is pretty small. Sorry if you cannot read it. But the point here is that your storage has now been moved to multiple locations worldwide with CloudFront, because your data is now cached at locations closer to your viewers. So in this scenario, let's say you have your application hosted in our region in um, US East 1, which is Virginia. And you have users trying to access your content from everywhere in the world. So for a user who's trying to access your data from Australia, for example, due to the fact that CloudFront catches the content closer to them, the request will automatically, from that user, would automatically get routed to a location in Australia, meaning that the request can be immediately served back from Australia instead of backhauling it all the way back into your origin, which could be US. So that is what CloudFront has enabled you, right? Because your storage has moved. Now, what Lambda at the Edge does is that you can now move your compute to your edge locations, right? So it's not just storage. You can extend your compute, meaning that some parts of your application can now be at the locations closer to the viewer. So it means that going back to the scenario I was talking about before, let's say the same user who's in Australia trying to access or makes a request to your website or web application, and let's say it's some sort of dynamic content, meaning that the, the request has to be, uh, there's some sort of compute that needs to run for the request to be fulfilled. With Lambda at the Edge being now globally distributed, your compute can be closer to the user, and the request can be now served from a location that's closest to him or her. And that means that if you are a website owner or if you have a web application, your end users are going to see great performance because uh, the request is served from a location that's approximately to him or her. Let's take a look at the different CloudFront events. So Lambda is an event-driven compute model, meaning there needs to be an event or a trigger for your functions to execute. With Lambda at the edge, the functions that you run can have four CloudFront triggers or events. But before we get into that, let's just take a look at this, uh, the picture here. So on the left side, you have your users. They could be located anywhere in the world. On the right side, it's your origin. Your origin could be in AWS, like an S3 bucket or a load balancer or um, an EC2 instance. Or it could also be your own HTTP server running your data center of Colo. CloudFront is really agnostic to where the origin runs. And in the middle, you have the CloudFront cache. So when a user tries to access, for simplicity here, let's assume you have a website you're trying to serve through CloudFront. So when the user tries to access your website, CloudFront has latency-based algorithms where it can automatically route the HTTP request to the location that's closest to the user. And once the request lands in the cache, if the data is already present, it's called a cache hit. CloudFront can immediately serve the response back. If the data is not present, then CloudFront would fetch the data from the origin you configure automatically. And then it caches the content and sends the request back to the viewer. So the next time the request comes in, uh, it's going to be a cache, miss, be cache hit because the data is cached. Now, this is a request response flow, a flow for a, uh, a typical CloudFront request. Now, let's see how, uh, let's look at the different uh, triggers or events for Lambda functions that are part of Lambda at the edge. The first one is viewer request. So if you want to run some sort of compute or some logic before the request does a cache lookup or before it, it hits the cache, then viewer request is the right event or trigger point for you. So 
So for example, if you want to do some sort of cache key manipulation, or let's say every time a request comes in, you want to make a call to your authentication server, which is located maybe in a data center or somewhere else, or you, you, another use case would be you are serving premium paywalled content. So each time a request comes in, you want to check, hey, does this user have permissions before to serve the content back? So it could be any of these. These are just a subset of use cases. But if you have these kind of use cases, then viewer request is the right um, trigger for you. Then we have origin request. Origin request gets triggered right before the request is sent to the origin in the case of a cache miss. Uh, a popular example, uh, use case for that would be URL rewrites. So let's say before you send the request to the origin, you probably want to manipulate the request, maybe rewrite the URL or insert a header. Uh, you could use origin request for that. Uh, the next one is origin response. This gets triggered right before the response is cached. So let's say one example, a common example we have seen is inserting security headers, maybe HSTS header, right? You want to insert that header to the response. You want to cache it. So you can either do it at the origin, or you could do it at the, uh, the origin response even using Lambda at the edge. And the last um, trigger or event here is viewer response. This gets triggered right before we send the response back, into, back to the user. So you can use, you can set up your CloudFront distribution, you can hook your Lambda functions to one or all of these four events that is, that are, that is available to you today. And Will, during his section, is going to walk you through more real-world examples. He's going to share some uh, code samples of how you can actually make use of each of these events. So let's take a look at some of the key capabilities of Lambda at the Edge. The first one is complete response generation at the Edge meaning that you can do full HTTP body generation at the edge without the need to go back to an origin server. And we have enhanced on that. Last week, we made a bunch of announcements. For example, now you can do your Lambda functions can support binary data. So a common use case there is image manipulation on the fly. We have heard customers who say that when a request comes in, they want to look, take a look at the user agent header. Depending on the end user device type, they probably want to serve a, a smaller or compressed version of the image or uh, serve different versions of the image. And now with support for binary, you can actually do the image cropping or image manipulation, image compression on the fly directly at an edge location closer to the viewer instead of sending the request all the way back to the origin. Uh, we support larger uh, Lambda functions. Now we can go up, uh, before it used to be 128 megabytes. That was the only function size we supported. But now we can support much larger there, larger limits there. Uh, we support larger HTTP response. So these are responses that you create directly at the edge. Uh, for the origin events, we support up to one megabyte, larger deployment packages, and longer timeouts. All these limits are in our documentation. If you want to take a look at uh, them after the session, they are available for you, uh, available for you there. The next uh, unique capability is the ability to make network calls, meaning your Lambda functions closer at the locations that are close to the viewers, can actually make a network call to any HTTP endpoint. This doesn't have to be in AWS. It can be your own authentication. It can be your own servers. Uh, we used to support, we support, we still support, uh, or from launch, we support for the origin events, meaning origin request and origin response. And we have an improved on that. Now you can now actually make, or make network calls from the viewer facing events. And Benjamin is going to talk about how their use case is leveraging that. And finally, uh, we announced content-based routing last week, meaning that now you can do layer 7 uh, request routing. You can take a look at the HTTP requests. You can look at the headers if you want. You can look at the query string parameters. You can look at the cookies. And based on that, you can decide to send the request to any origin, any dynamic origin at that point of time. So a common use case for that would be, let's say you have a multiple origin or multiple data center set up spread across multiple geographies, and you want to make sure all users who are coming in from US are sent to your data center in US. You, you, uh, users from, let's say, Europe, you want to send them to your another, another origin you have in Europe. So you can do those kind of proximity-based proximity routing using uh, Lambda at the edge with content-based routing. Another popular example there is on um, how to handle web crawlers. We have heard from customers who have a separate origin, or it could even be a third-party service, who's serving a pre-rendered version of the website, which is search engine optimized. And from, for the regular users, they want to send to another origin. 
So now with content-based routing, what you can do is you can inspect, it could be user agent, or you can take a look at the request, any request property, and then decide if it's a web crawl, I'm gonna send him to this origin. If he's a regular user, I'm gonna send him to my other origin. Another popular example is on blue-green deployments and A-B testing. So now you can have multiple versions. You could have of your application running at different origins, and you can use content-based routing. So as a request comes in, you could probably take a look at a cookie. If the cookie is not set, there's a request coming in for the first time. You can, based on the logic you have, you can send it to either one of the origins. And you can set a cookie so that subsequent times or subsequent requests are now routed to the right origin based on the cookie you have sent before. So these are some of the key capabilities that I want to call out today on Lambda at the Edge. Uh, with that, let me hand it over to Will, who's going to walk you through some real popular use cases of how you can leverage Lambda at the Edge for solving some of these challenges. Awesome. Thank you, George. <clears throat> so let's talk use cases. Am I, am I on? Cool. So let's talk use cases. If you're looking at a typical monolithic web application, you have your end user is accessing you know, an elastic load balancer, hitting your backend servers, you know, usually hitting some sort of cache for persistence, some sort of object or file store for user uploads and assets and other content, you know, some sort of database, you know, the system of record for persistence. And you're implementing you know, all sorts of functions across your different applications uh, but that uh, are in common. Your authentication and authorization, uh, content management and processing. How do I handle user uploads? How do I re-encode images? How do I resize images, et cetera? Um, or localization, internationalization, personalization. You know, how do I res respond differently depending on the user or what the context is? And in a monolithic application, you know, this is all baked into your code. If you're using a certain authentication you know, me mechanism, you're going to use the same library you know, in the same language, but you're going to need a different library for a different language. You're going to need to you know, tailor depending on each application. And so there could be a lot of redundant code across your various monolithic applications. Um, so as a result, we see a lot of customers migrating to microservices. And I want to talk a little bit about how you can use uh, Lambda at Edge to implement some of those microservices. You know, how do you implement authentication authorization at the edge? How do I offload some of my content management and processing? You know, take that out of my application and move it closer to the edge? Or how do I you know, localize, internationalize, personalize content for my end users? Uh, so as George mentioned, there's four hooks uh, where you can uh, insert a Lambda function in the request response lifecycle for Lambda at Edge. Um, the first one I want to talk about, just going in order, is viewer request. Just to recap really quick, a viewer request is executed on every request uh, before CloudFront's cache is checked. Um, in this request, you can modify the uh, parameters that will be used for the cache key. So this is your URL, this is your cookies, headers, query strings. Uh, you can perform authentication authorization checks. You know, this is going to be executed on every request, regardless of whether or not it's a cache hit or miss. You can make external network calls. This is a new feature. And you can generate responses directly to the end user that will not be cached. These are personal to the end user. It is all occurring before the cache. So one common example is, what if I want to do stateless authentication? Um, you know, I have my user agent, typically you know, some sort of identity provider. In this case, the user is going to present some sort of credential and get back a JSON web token in response. And so I'm going to pass this JWT to my CloudFront distribution. CloudFront configured normally can pass that JWT right along. Um, the origin application will then use the public key to evaluate it and then make an access decision. What if I have another origin, or I have a legacy application that you know, doesn't support JWT auth, or I have an S3 bucket? You know, I could use signed cookies, but maybe I just want to use the same JWT for all of, it, all of that. How do I get to an access decision here? I can actually do that by you know, taking advantage of some of the extensibility in JWT. So in this case, I've just added some private claims um, making an asset, for making an asset access decision that uh, will be evaluated at the edge. And now, instead of um, passing that right along to the origin, we're first going to hook into a viewer request event. Viewer request event has the copy of the public key. Uh, takes the JWT, pass along in the header, makes an access decision, then either forwards it to the correct origin or returns a, a correct error message. With, uh, and now with the ability to make external network calls from viewer request events, I can actually implement state full auth now. So this is actually very useful if you're, say, a you know, web publisher that has you know, some sort of external uh, entitlement service that's going to determine whether or not a given cookie or session ID has access to a given piece of content. So here, we're just going to invoke our CloudFront, invoke our viewer request event from our CloudFront distribution. You know, assume we're passing in a cookie or something. Make an HTTP request out to our entitlement service. 
uh, we're going to come to an access decision there, then either board that along to the origin or you know, return a custom response. This could be a you know, 403, a redirect to your identity provider, or it could be something custom like a paywall message. You know, please, please log in, please uh, subscribe to our service. You, know, you could push this out, particularly if you have a lot of different origins. You know, if you're a publisher, you may have different properties, different verticals, different CMSs. You, know, you can now factor all this out into Lambda at the Edge. Move on to the next set of use cases, origin requests events. Uh, we've got quite a few for these. So just to recap, an origin request event occurs after the cache is checked, so this is only going to be on cache miss, uh, and before you hit the origin, but you also have the ability to bypass the origin altogether and return a custom response. Um, again, evaluate on a cache miss. Um, you can make one or more external network calls within your uh, time limit. Uh, you can dynamically select an origin based on request headers. This should actually say new, new feature. Um, you can implement pretty URLs. Say you want to create a, a single logical uh, URL scheme and then you know, feed that out to more and more legacy origins where you can't modify the URL. You can rewrite your URL there. And the big thing is generate responses that can be cached. Um, the cache key is going to be based on the request URL, not the URL you eventually rewrite it to. And you can also generate responses in a custom way that will be cached. One uh, quick and dirty example of this is you know, just being able to synthesize an entire HTTP uh, response body. So in this case, I've just got a simple mustache template, and then you know, combine that with a, a JSON object from you know, a database like you know, MongoDB or DynamoDB, your application, combine that into a single page. Uh, really simply, just go in, uh, your cache behavior is going to hook into an origin request event, uh, going to make an ex external network call to an S3 bucket, uh, make an external network call to a DynamoDB table, then return the rendered template, which can then be cached for a response on subsequent uh, requests. And just a really quick example of what the code for this looks like. You know, here we you know, set up our constants, our you know, S3 bucket with our templates in it, our DynamoDB table with our you know, blog posts in it, and require our libraries, we're using mustache for templating, you know, connect to our, uh, create our handlers for S3 and DynamoDB, uh, sort of uh, create the skeleton for our response. Then we're going to make a call to DynamoDB, identify the uh, template ID that we, or the template file name that we'd like to pull out, and then actually call the template, pull the template from S3, execute the mustache template with the, uh, the contact. So let me just do a really quick demo. Here again, this is the code, you know, similar code to what I just demonstrated. And here's a little bit more you know, filled out template. In this case, we're just pulling out title and date. We just want to inline the post here. We've got some CSS to style it. A really simple blogging engine using DynamoDB as our back end. So in this case, I've just got hello world, you know, paragraph, have a couple AWS what's new posts in here. So let me just try it go to my CloudFront console, get my demo URL, hello-world. Make sure I'm connected to the internet. There we go, hello world. Now, now we're generating custom HTTP responses from Lambda at the Edge. Maybe pull in a little bigger piece here. And so all this is being generated at the edge. Um, for the purpose of this demo, I'm not caching it, but you would obviously want to set cache control headers when you uh, do this for real. There are some other things I might want to do. Um, I can create pretty URLs for a consistent user API experience. Uh, one example of this that came up recently was um, map tiles. There's a fairly standard way to you know, create a standard URL scheme for map tiles, but you want to decouple it from the way you're probably storing or generating those tiles on the back end. Um, you want to present this to your end user, but then you might have different origins. You might have one or more S3 buckets for different versions of your tiles. Uh, you might have a legacy service that generates these or an elastic load balancer. Maybe you have different origins for different parts of the world for whatever reason. You know, uh, but you always want to present that unified interface to the end user without having to you know, make changes to your origin if that's going to be painful or difficult for you to do. Here's an example. So I just want to, in this case, I'm storing all of my tiles in S3 as um, SHA-256 versions of the URL, uh, URL path. Uh, this allows me to uh, get more concurrent rights to S3 when I'm generating new tiles. 
uh, but I want it to be cached at the you know, URL that the user is presenting. So in this case, we respond from the cloud, we uh, rewrite the URL to make the origin request. CloudFront uh, caches the response under the uh, requested key, and then the user you know, never sees the uh, back end. Similarly, we can also use uh, origin requests to do custom image processing. You know, if you're using a CMS or an e-commerce website, you, have, uh, you know, often need to get the same image with different thumbnail sizes without having to pre-generate them. So in this case, we can build an you know, architecture using origin request events to uh, you know, try to find something from an existing S3 bucket. You know, maybe we don't find it. We, in that case, use API Gateway to invoke another uh, Lambda function. This is going to pull the image originals from that S3 bucket, you know, ex execute that resize or re-encoding operation, put it in the, uh, put it in the uh, S3 bucket for thumbnails for later use, and then return that to the uh, original uh, request. Or imagine for a second that you're a SaaS provider. So you obviously are. You know, I'm operating a single endpoint at uh, sas.example.com. And let's say I'm currently deployed in a single region. You know, all of my customers are customers in region A, and they're going to you know, my deployment in region A. But as I want to expand worldwide, how do I, you know, deploy in another region? You know, have my customers from region B go to that region, but I want to make that transparent. You know, I don't want to have to redirect them, or I want to be able to load balance maybe across different regions of the United States. You know, I can now use uh, a content-based routing in an origin request event to uh, inspect the actual request, get an idea of what, um, you know, where this user belongs, and then push them along to the right origin. So for an example, if I start my SaaS business out of US East 1, you know, that's going to be, you know, give me pretty good performance in the United States, you know, not so good in uh, Europe and particularly in Asia. You know, maybe ne my next step is to, you know, move all of my customers to the uh, Europe region I spun up. And then from there, you know, sp you know, spin up another one in Japan, and then uh, all the way down under, you know, bring them into their own region, and now everyone has talking to a local version of the SaaS, the SaaS service with their own data located in their own country. So how do I do this? You know, if I'm looking at the login flow for my SaaS application, um, you know, I have a user database that's going to, you know, determine, you know, what where my user, uh, you know, what accounts my users belong to, you know, authenticate them with their passwords. In this case, Jane is going to log in. We're going to return 200 OK. So what I'm going to do is take my user database and add a column to it with their home region. In this case, I've deployed to three regions. And then when Jane logs in, we now know, OK, Jane, uh, you belong in Europe. So we're going to set that cookie when she first logs in to EU. And so now on subsequent requests, connect to the distribution. You know, in this case, we're still keeping our user database in our home region or our you know, original region. And all of our login requests are going to go back to that home region. You know, you're not going to hit the login page very often. If it's a little slow worldwide, you know, that's okay. And then when they log in, we're going to set the cookie. And then on all subsequent requests, as a logged in user, um, the origin request event will be invoked and then make a decision on which origin to send the user to. If they're based in North America. We're going to go to North American origin where they have you know, customer data in the, their database. Maybe they're in Europe. Maybe they're in uh, you know, Asia Pacific. So this is very useful, particularly for you know, uh, distributing your customers across multiple regions, um, being able to make that change transparently in a way that's not necessarily going to break their experience. Um, as George mentioned earlier, there's other use cases, uh, routing based on user agent. Uh, you might have different origins for your uh, you know, mobile websites. You might have different origins for your uh, search engines, et cetera. Or you might want to generate a redirect for the purposes of internationalization. So if you, you know, inspect the accept language header, the CloudFront user your country header, you know, maybe we know in this case that this user is going to be um, you know, going to prefer the German version of the website. So we'll just go ahead and send a redirect to Germany. And then maybe they decide to override that. You know, I'm on vacation in Germany, and all of a sudden the whole, you know, whole internet's in German. You know, if I click on English, I want to set a cookie so that subsequently all of my requests are going to be uh, um, you know, forwarded to the you know, English origin. Here's an example of the, uh, the code you'd use to do this. Um, in this case, we're doing something different. We're setting up um, in the request, uh, actually request object, there is a new, um, a new field that appeared a few days ago um, for the, uh, for the uh, origin. So you can go and you can set that to either customer S3. In this case, we're just going to reset the domain name to the domain name of the origin we've selected. And we just have sort of a stub choose origin function there. Let me do a demonstration real quick. So I've set up three origins. Um, you can sort of see the text there. You know, US East 1, 
AP Northeast one, EU West one. Each of these, you just go there, it's gonna tell you, you know, I'm logged into the Japan region, I'm logged into the Europe region. Then I have the Cloudflare distribution. And if I just go to the root of that, it's going to see that I've not authenticated. It's gonna ask me to choose my preferred origin. So in this case, I'd like my preferred origin to be Europe. We push this in here. And now on subsequent requests, instead of being redirected back to choose, I'm being, you know, being sent the you're logged into Europe message. In this case, I know it's hard to see. I try to figure out how to make this bigger. But we've now set the cookie, the region cookie to EU S1. So I can you know, go ahead and clear that cookie out, and, you know, log out. Then go in, hit Japan. You know, even if I open up a new window, Japan is obviously my new preferred origin. And so I've just implemented this fairly simply. Um, on the back end, on, on each origin, I have a simple Flask application. You know, we're just looking into the you know, index here. You know, we're going to say, you know, return, you, know, you are located in the you know, XYZ region. And then we implement two uh, resources here for choose. Uh, you know, on the, on the Git, we're just gonna prompt them with the, uh, the form to change their preferred region. And then on post, we're gonna set that cookie to region. And in the Lambda function, have some helper functions here. But the big thing is, uh, we look at the request URI. If it's, you know, slash choose, then we just go ahead and pass that request through. You know, we want to allow the user to change their region. If not, we're gonna check to see, you know, were we able to parse, you know, were we able to parse the cookies? Was the, re was the region cookie set? In this case, we're actually going to directly overwrite the uh, uh, origin object um, using the parse cookie, and then I'm just constructing a URL directly out of that. So you'd want to do something more complex with your, for a typical SaaS application, but this is a good demo for, to get a feel for how it works. Moving on along, we have origin response events. So we've now, you know, in an origin response event, we've, you know, the viewer request has come in, we've, you know, definitely had a cache miss, we've made a request to the origin, and then that origin response has been returned. Uh, it's executed on a cache miss. Um, and here we can make external network calls, uh, and we can modify the response headers prior to caching. So this is a good place to do all of your origin fix up stuff. Uh, maybe you're trying to standardize the cache headers from an origin that you can't really control. Or maybe you're trying to you know, piece together a you know, coherent application for multiple different origins. If you need to rewrite the headers for any reason, you know, you know, fix content type, et cetera, this is the place to do it. One common use case is we hear from customers that they'd like to set um, HTTP security headers across all of their different applications. And you know, some of them are legacy, they're in different teams. You know, it's, not always, it's not always easy or trivial to find all of your different dependencies and you know, modify the headers that they're writing out. So in this case, we can just write a Lambda function that says, I want to set strict transport security. You know, we're all on HTTPS. Uh, but you can also do this for other headers. I mentioned cache control, um, content security policy is another big one. That's going to be the primary use case for origin response events. Again, we also have viewer response events. So a viewer response, this is going to be after, a, um, you know, after we've returned from the origin and we've you know, cached the response, or after a response has been returned from the cache. So this is primarily useful because it's executed on all requests after the response is received from the origin or cache. We can modify the response headers without caching the results. So this is going to be for you know, content personalization. You know, whatever response we generate here or whatever headers we fix here are going to be unique to that end user. Um, we can also make external network calls here. Now, the primary use case is we're going to want to set user cookies for you know, various reasons. You know, maybe we just want to you know, uh, assign a unique identifier to end users so that we, in our analytics we can track you know, uh, you know, unique engagements. Uh, or maybe I want to you know, sort my group users up into different groups for A-B testing. In that case, uh, our viewer response event you know, checks the CloudFront cache. You know, on cache miss or a you know, return response, we're going to invoke it. And in this case, all we're doing is we're generating a, a UUID v4 uh, and then setting that in the user cookie. You know, again, you could set different cookies. You could set various headers, depending on your application. But this is going to be unique to the end user and invoked on every request. So those are some of the, the primary use cases we've um, you know, seen and heard about. Um, now I want to talk about a very important use case, and uh, you give the floor over to uh, Benjamin from Datadome. Hi.
Hi, <coughs> can you hear me? Yeah. I'm very glad to be here. Today, we are going to talk about bot protection and how we moved it to the age. I'm Benjamin, Datadom co-founder and CTO. You're here to discover a use case on how to integrate Lambda at the age inside your architecture. And by the way, I'm from Paris, but you probably noticed that. This is an expert conference, so I guess you expect some code and some architecture design. That's what we are going to see in a minute. But let's start with some context. So what is Datadom? Datadom is an intelligent data protection for websites and APIs. Protect from what? From the bot activity. As you are experts, you may know some, what is a robot. Robots are sm some small software that call the internet to either scrap the content, try to inject uh, SQL, or to hack websites. Our job is to protect websites and APIs from this bot activity. How do we do that? First, by running a real-time analysis and providing reaction tools. Those tools allow our customers to decide which kind of robot they want to allow, to block, or to redirect. So what can you expect from this session? First, I will share with you the challenge of running the real-time bot protection. Then, we will see how to protect the origin. And last, but not least, how we moved it to the age. First, let me ask you a question. In percentage, what is the volume of the bot traffic? This may come as a surprise, but more than 50% of the website traffic is not generated by human, but by robots. And those robots are more and more clever, using very basic technology a few years ago without any JavaScript rendering they moved to more clever solutions like PhantomJS or CasperJS with a poor JavaScript rendering. And lately, they use something great for Scrapper, which is Chromedless. It means that you can run Chrome inside a command line. And bots are massively distributed, using hundreds, thousands, millions of IPs. And today we are talking about four billions of IPv4, but let's think when they will use completely IPv6 with billions of billions of billions of IPs. So in order to detect and to block those robots, there is just one solution, detect and block them in real time. And we have fixed the target to two milliseconds. So let's take a look on how to protect the origin. So, this is basically how Datadom is working. We are taking a look to the incoming traffic, detect if it's a robot or a human, and when it's a bot, is it a good one, a bad one, or a commercial one? The good one are Google bot, Facebook, Yahoo, Twitter. The bad one are the bots that try to inject, to act, to brute force. And you want to block that kind of robot. And the commercial one are the robots that scrap the content to analyze it, and to send it. You can take a look here at the standard infrastructure as a service integration. We provide modules for web servers like Apache, IIS, Nginx, or Varnish. Our module will hook the incoming traffic, send it to our API, and in two milliseconds we'll get the answer. Should we allow or block this traffic or send fake content? So as you, as you can see, Datadom is in the critical path. That means we have two huge challenges. The first one is the latency. Because every time a visitor comes on the website, it will make a call to Datadom API. So we have to be as fast as possible. And the second one is the scalability. Because we have to scale up and scale down at the same time our customer does. We have worked on splitting the detection in three stages. The first one in real time, in the synchronous process. The second one, this is the fast streaming engine. And the last one, in a few minutes, which is the behavior detection. Synchronous and asynchronous. 
In terms of architecture, you can see here that the traffic is coming from one of our modules. We are going through an Elastic Beanstalk uh, with all our API servers, and we have this infrastructure in many data centers. In the global detection capability shared across all Amazon data centers, we are using Kafka and we are using Flink as a streaming engine. And finally, there is also a global detection for the behavior analysis using some machine learning algorithm. So what we have been able to achieve so far. First, we are running this real-time detection below two milliseconds. Then we are sharing our detection capability across a few data centers. And finally, we are able to detect uh, and to protect more than 15 billion hit per month. Now, let's take a look at the age. So first, why Lambda at the age? Why does it make sense for us to use Lambda at the age? Let me back in the past. It was last summer. We were in Paris Amazon Summit, and we had a discussion with some great Amazon architect. And when they discover our use case, they immediately say, you have to try Lambda at the age, because it could be a great way to integrate your solution to the largest cloud front uh, users. So we got in touch with the Lambda at the age beta program. We joined it, and we have started to re-implement our module using Lambda. So you saw CloudFront. CloudFront distributes content through thousands of web servers. This is great because that means your content will be delivered fast to all users using all Amazon capability. But on the other side, it means it starts to be difficult to protect your content because it will be cached in thousands of different web servers. So in order to protect it, we can use Lambda. So here is how the integration is working. So we are using an Amazon Lambda viewer request. That means every time there is an incoming request to your cloud from distribution, the Lambda function will be executed. This Lambda code will reach Datadom API, and based on the answer, the Lambda code will decide either to reach the cloud from standard process or to block it and to send the response. That means that our API will be reached by all CloudFront web servers all around the world. So in order to have a great latency, we had to deploy our infrastructure in as many Amazon data centers as possible. That's what we did. So now we have 11 point of presence. Second point the Lambda function will reach our API, so we have to use a single endpoint. So you, we use for that root 53. Root 53 will resolve to the closest data dome point of presence. So now let's take a look to the global process. So here we are seeing a legitimate human request. So the traffic is coming from a browser. The viewer request is triggered, and the call is made to Datanome API. Our API will return here a 200 code. That means it's the signal to the Lambda function that Lambda should continue the regular process. And there are two options. The first one is Lambda and CloudFront will serve the content from the cache. And the second one is the cache is not fresh, or the cache should not be used, and we will reach the origin. Now let's take a look to uh, illegitimate bot request. Here on the picture, it's quite obvious that this is a robot. But in the real life, robots are more clever than that, and they will be more like a human. But well, you understand the idea. So then the viewer request is triggered. We send this fingerprint to Datadom API. Our API will return a 403 code because it decides that even if it looks like a human, it's a robot, and that our customer decide to block it. So we will send back this information to the Lambda code, and we will quit completely the cloud front process, and we will send back an answer. And in our case, we are using the 
full generation capability because the Lambda function will generate a full page embedding a CAPTCHA. Because we never completely block the request, we will send back a CAPTCHA to avoid any false positive. Now let's take a look to the code. Our modules, regular modules, are in C or C++. So here, as for now, Lambda at the age only support Node.js, we had to redevelop our modules. But it was actually pretty easy. Let's take a look to the code. So here, we are uh, at the viewer request. We are loading a few external libraries. And we are making the hook on all incoming requests. We are storing the information sent along on the request inside a constant. Why? Because in order to make this bot detection, we have to collect almost all headers from the incoming request. This is where we are collecting all these headers. We are storing here the protocol, the request, the methods, all either like host, user, agent, referrer, etc. Then we are preparing the request to, to the external call to our API. You can see here that we are using API Lambda endpoint, which will resolve to the closest API servers. We prepare the request and we send it. Here, based on the answer of the API server, we will either, in case of 200 code, let the regular cloud front process continue, or, in case of 403, read the response from the API and generate a new body response and stop the regular process. So it's pretty easy, just three steps. First, we extract information from the incoming request. Then, we prepare and send the fingerprint to the closest data dump API server. And then, depending on the answer, we will allow, block the request, or send fake content. So what's next? This is the first step of using Lambda as the edge. But we have many things that we would like to do now that we discover how powerful is it. First, we can serve a specific CAPTCHA using a browser detection. We have CAPTCHA for a desktop, for mobile, and also for native uh, application. Then we can use a different caching policy based on the bot statue. It means that when it's a, a robot, a good one, for instance, a Google or Facebook, uh, we can serve the content from the cache. And when it's a human, we can serve it from the origin. Then we can uh, use the origin request to select a different origin. For instance, let's say uh, it's a human. You will want to serve it from the application to have a very fresh content. When it's uh, a bot, let's say Google bot, you may want to use an alternative origin with content from a varnish, for instance, to serve it as fast as possible. And finally, using the viewer response, you may want to generate fake content for scrappers, for instance. So what we have been able to achieve? First, thanks to Lambda, now Datadon can be set up without any modules for Varnish, Apache, for web servers. Then we can be set up in any serverless architecture. And that's a big trend we are seeing to all our customers. And last, and this is probably the most powerful feature, is that we can protect the content from the bot activity even when it's served from the cache. So thanks to Lambda at the age, Datadom is now the first intelligent data protection all over the world. So thank you for your time. We have a free trial and we will be very happy to hear your feedback. Let's connect and we will be available in the room if you have any further questions. Thank you.